I bring in Tim Robinson to this to this uh, mm. reference. Um, at the time, Tim was writing, or, uh, you know, um, preparing his, his great books on Connemara and his map making, um, and John was, um, uh, I suppose, you know, writing Nostros and, and, and the, er the early books. Um, but John, uh, it could happen, and it's like a, a kind of a celestial. Um, uh, astronomical phenomenon where, you know, uh, the two planets uh, uh, cross their um, orbits. Uh, and I remember standing outside the door of Balan Ange one day and seeing John walking towards Tombiola, as John did, because John shied away from any form of, of, of mm. motor cars or anything like that. And uh, although he did use a bike. And then in the opposite direction, Tim walking towards Balan Afad with his satchel on his back and the two of them passed like that uh, uh, great uh, you know planets of learning mm. intellectual powerhouses and their paths were crossing uh, each in their own world their own intellectual world and their own spiritual world and I remember saying to myself at the time and I sensed this I said I am privileged to be seeing two great writers and two great minds you know in their own orbits doing their own work I wasn't in their orbits I wasn't able to be in their orbits um, and I was really privileged to see that great work being done at that time and sitting in the bar was Martin Holleran having his drink mm. and he was in that in that orbit in his own way mm. and was important and I said you know I'm glad I'm here at this time to see this happening to see this creative energy um, I've often said Tim Robinson and John Moriarty were like two of these tectonic plates that meet, mm. you know, and there is a, just an absolute earthquake and a volcanic eruption of creativity. And it happened here, it happened here in this house, it happened here by this river, and in Tumbiola and in Roundstone. There was a, just a, a meeting of great learning, uh, and I was privileged to witness it, not to be writing it but mm. to witness it happening mm. and I remember saying at the time I did realise that it was happening and all was there in the background giving wise wisdom, wise words with Martin Holland We live in a world of terrible fixed species and Berlin walls between all the species all our personalities all our natures are really masks in a way so i love this sense that the species far from being fixed they are interchangeable and if if i am just my person my empirical personhood that is really a mask assumed for the moment by the one great spirit there is one universal great spirit and it wears many masks and the masks are interchangeable if the Christian story wishes to be the great story it is, or any story, any story that wishes to be a great story, it must literally include everything. I mean, there's no point in just being ecumenical towards Protestants and Catholics to be ecumenical towards Protestants. We have to be ecumenical towards animals, and we have to be ecumenical. We can only be ecumenical towards animals when we're ecumenical towards the animal in ourselves. I remember it vividly. Um... It was when he was working at Letterdive House as a gardener. Letterdive House is just a few hundred yards uh, north of Roundstone here. John had a, a little flat attached to the big house. And I had heard, before I met him, I had heard that there were rumours that a, a philosopher or a magician or a wizard of some sort, a mystic, uh, was working as a gardener in Letterdive House. It seemed very intriguing to me. So um, one day when I'd been out uh, exploring, I was making my map of Connemara at the time and I'd been out exploring in, in Ishni and I was walking home from there. And as I passed Letterdive House, I heard um, the sound of an axe or a mallet or something like that in, in the wood there. And so I thought, this is my opportunity to meet this wizard. Uh, I'll turn in at the gate here and introduce myself. And uh, there I found John, um, a man built on a grand scale, I think is 
how I think of him now. He was uh, a big fellow, um, vigorous, smiling, a shock of grey hair, curly grey hair, um, an outward facing individual, uh, very, very ready to communicate and so on. And I told him in a couple of words what I'd been doing and he told me in a couple of words what he'd been doing and uh, within a few minutes we were on a subject which uh, seemed to crop up every time I met him, which was the one and the all. He being on the side of the one and me being in, on the side of the all and so on. What we ever meant by these terms never became clear. Thereafter he quite often uh, called on us in Rhinestone uh, when he was doing his bit of shopping in the in the town. Very frugal shopping, I must say. Then we would feed him up a bit and uh, try and get some food into him and persuade him to eat more and drink more and so on. He wanted to talk. He was a magnificent talker. Uh, very good on, on certain aspects of English literature and so on. Uh, so it was a great pleasure to to know him and, and get to know him. And then he left uh, Rhinestone and went back to his native Kerry to our great loss. And later on I visited him down there. Uh, I wrote an account of that visit in, in a piece called Firewalking, uh, which was eventually published as a Farewell to the Goddess. And you'll see the relevance of the Goddess, because I'll read a bit, if I may, from this book. Thank you very much, Brendan. Um, you mentioned Lynn bringing branches in 
Lynn tells me that this branch here is the very silver branch that uh, prompted John's conception of silver branch perception. And what silver branch perception is, you'll have to buy the book to find out. <laughs> so welcome to you all. Those of you who already know the works of John Moriarty, and I see some of his long-term su supporters here. It's lovely to see Eileen and John's sisters and many others. And those who might be tempted to put a toe into the torrent of his writing for the first time. Uh, the book we're launching today is a continuation of his vast autobiography, Nostos, which I'm told is the Greek for homecoming. And of course, Connemara was his home for many years, and we all miss him. But this can be a happy occasion, one of celebration, because as I was able to tell John by phone shortly before he died, he died he'd had a splendid life, and he had to agree. A rich life, and not rich in possessions, but in passions and productions. It was a privilege to know him, not just as a thinker, but as a friend and neighbour. On Sir Christopher Wren's tomb in St Paul's Cathedral, it says in Latin, if you require a monument, look around you. Now, here is John's monument, these books, a cathedral of writing. And like a cathedral, it is repetitive, arch after arch, pillar after pillar, adding up to something vast and impressive. His style is dense and liturgical. So, I'm going to take the liberty of rendering down his thought uh, to a few minutes, just to give an initial toehold on it, before reading something I wrote a long time ago on him as a friend and an argumentative sparring partner. John was physically big and big-souled, literally magnanimous as well. His ideas were all big ideas, and he took them with the utmost seriousness and acted on them. If they conflicted, he lived and suffered that conflict. Now, most of us have ideas that conflict, but our ideas are so undeveloped that the conflict really causes us no discomfort. But with John, the conflicts were titanic, life-changing struggles. There were perhaps five or six such collisions of ideas in his life. The first was early. John was born into a small Kerry farm, a close-up world of folklore, and traditional ways, and unquestioning Catholicism. And then as a younger, as a youngster, he came across Darwin. Now here was an account, a convincing account of the world as being millions of years old and of life as having evolved according to natural laws. Nothing here about Adam and Eve from the rest of the Genesis story. If the Bible story is true, it is not in a literal sense, but in a metaphorical one. John lived this contradiction. He fell out of his story, as he puts it. He fell out of the comforting and supportive network of his childhood beliefs. By the time he was at university, he was an atheist. And he always kept his interest in science and his love of long, technical-sounding words, of which he invented many more for himself. <laughs> he also soaked himself in, our, in English literature, the standard classics, Shakespeare, the Romantic poets. He had a formidable memory and could quote at length. He amazed me sometimes by quoting my own stuff. <laughs> then he went off to Canada to teach English literature, and here came a second collision. One day he was teaching Keats, uh, the Ode to a Nightingale perhaps, or some other work, redolent of the harmony and the beauty, quiet, calm of the English countryside. And he looked out of the window, and there it was blowing a white blizzard, a snowstorm that would have killed you if you went out into it unprepared. Nothing between him and the pole but a thousand miles of snow and ice. English literature suddenly seemed inadequate to the world, which was huge and magnificent, and utterly indifferent to human life. He therefore embarked on a quest for a fitting expression of this vision, ransacking the world's legends and mythologies. He gave up the job. He came to Connemara almost as a hermit, trying, as he said, to wash European culture out of his mind and open it to a wider vision. He found the mystics, the medieval Christian mystics of the Rhine Valley, the Buddhist sages, the Muslim Sufi poets, and the Native American drug dreamers. Now, the mystic makes a personal and solitary journey into the deep spaces of the psyche 
and perhaps John wanted to emulate them. But usually, the shaman, the seer, who explores these worlds and bring back, brings back wisdom to us, is supported by a community that understands what it is about, this dangerous journey. John was alone, and he soon got into deep spiritual trouble over it. Cracks opened in his psyche, some of which perhaps never fully healed. He was directed to Father Norbert in Oxford, and under his direction, found peace and solace in the regular, prayerful and laborious life of a Christian community. He began to write and to give his talks. Back in Ireland, he evolved his own mythology, finding the Irish mythological cycles more meaningful, more expressive of this wonderful, horrific universe than even the Greek legends. But even all this amalgam of worldwide wisdom literature was not enough, not adequate to what he wanted to express. He believed that humankind is a natural product of evolution, and that meant that all the primitive stages we have passed through still lie within us like geological layers. If we suppress them, we get into trouble. John hated the legends of giant killers, heroes who rid the world of monsters, Gilgamesh from the Babylonian legends, St. George of England. These are just enacting the suppression of nature within us and without, including our destruction of the natural environment. John needed a myth that tells the story of how we can be at one with those interior terrors, the dark and dangerous layers of our inherited psyche. He found it in the Christian idea of the Incarnation. For John, when God became man in the form of Christ, he took on himself all the depths of humanity's conflictual nature. That is the meaning of John's myth of Christ going down into the depths of the Grand Canyon, down that wonderfully named path, Bright Angel Trail, that descends through stratum after stratum to the bottom of the canyon. But at the same time, for John, this world of space and time was not the whole story, as he often put it, not the whole story. Our reason our inquiring scientific mind, he said, can understand so much, but it also shields us or blinds us to the eternal and infinite reality. To reach that otherness, the reason has to be sacrificed. That, for him, was the sense of the many legends in which the hero faces being beheaded, sacrifices his reasoning cap capabilities in return for enlightenment. Prayer and meditation take over from reason and the senses. So finally, John was trying to set up his own prayerful community, which he called Shli Nafirina, the way of truth, after the lovely Irish phrase for the journey after death. What will happen in practical terms to that project, now that John's giant presence and total conviction is not here to drive it into reality, I don't know. But perhaps it does not matter, for he has written down his vision of it, and it exists in the world of words. That's an extremely crude and hasty sketch of John's life, a spontaneous and for this occasion only. I'll finish with a piece I wrote years ago when I was uh, travelling Connemara making my map of it, and I first met John, and then later when I visited him in Kerry. Then I'll ask Anthony Farrell to tell us about publishing John's work, and then we can all mingle and reminisce and look at the new book and listen to some music. Uh, perhaps this piece will uh, indicate something of John's scope in that um, it might show that you, you don't actually have to believe in the things that John believed in in order to revere the man and indeed to love him. One winter evening, cycling home from field work in Inishni, as I passed under the great beech trees that shadow the road just north of Roundstone, I heard a sound axe, mallet, spade, I forget which, but one of the forthright notes of countryside handwork from within the wood. The little domain and the Victorian mansion hidden within it, once the home of the landlord's agent, now belongs to a consortium of nature-loving Dutch, who at that time employed as their gardener a learned hermit, a philosopher, perhaps a mystic, or so I had heard. I left my bike at the gate, and went in to find this curiosity. John Moriarty looked much as he appears on one of the covers of the strange treatises that he was to publish subsequently, 
large framed, and one with a spade or axe or mallet he was shouldering, in an ancient work jacket of many pockets and a wide leather belt that gave him the figure of a Tolstoy. His big visage also had enough pockets for a lifetime's tremendous experiences and was topped by a joyful explosion of grey curly hair. We talked, and as on many later occasions, it took only a couple of introductory sentences to bring us to the question of the one and the many. Through a gap in the trees, Inish Nee appeared across the bay, crystallised by the level rays of sunset. Full of my findings, I named all its inlets and headlands and hillocks. John was admiringly receptive to this excursion into the many, but his quest was interior. Some years earlier, he had abandoned a university career in Canada, having looked up from the Keats ode he was expanding and realised how inadequate its assumptions were to the howling desert of snow filling the classroom window, and had returned to Ireland, supporting himself with odd jobs, searching for a place in which to purge his mind of its European culture and open it to the vastitude of the divine. The intervening years had been of solitude, ascesis, and near breakdown. But, as I was to discover, his unremitting application to the working out of his vision is in no conflict with a fine sense of humour and a generous and inventive humanity. On that occasion, we each stood our ground, which, according to me, was on a certain planet, in such and such a country, such and such a county, barony, townland, and so definably on indefinitely. Whereas to him, this pyramidology of place was a pointless horror unless it ultimately rested on divine ground. Summing up, John felt that deep down he agreed, but I thought this was typical of his metaphysical thirst for the one, and that in fact we disagreed, in accordance with my basic tenet that difference is the sine qua non of existence. <coughs> As we parted, I remember, a huge full moon like a ripe peach floated up into a silk-green sky from the snow-dusted peaks of the Twelve Bends, and Connemara momentarily became a province of mystic Tibet. After that, John used to call in whenever he was in Ramstone for his frugal shopping, and we had many resounding arguments. One day, M, my partner, had to banish us from the kitchen because we were thumping each other over the head with this dreadful word, epistemology. Epistemology. Whack! Epistemology. Bang! With such violence that the sauce she was preparing separated. <laughs> On Sundays, John would find M and me having breakfast in bed, cyberetically pillowed, and would take a seat opposite us, and sip a cup of lukewarm water, and hold forth about the abyss until we began to feel it opening immediately at the foot of our bed. <laughs> In those years, he was compounding what seemed to me a bizarre synthesis of shamanism and Christology out of an exorbitant array of excerpts from all the world's myths. I was anxious to get a sense of the whole of this mighty work and persuaded him to send his bulky typescripts, which he was convinced were unpublishable, to Anthony Farrell at Lilliput Press, who had venturesomely undertaken my book, Stones of Adam. The result to date has been five tomes, Dreamtime, the trilogy Turtle Was Gone a Long Time, and the autobiographical Nostos, slow sellers, largely ignored by the literary scene shifters, but defiantly existent, asserting their rights to shelf space in futurity. In all, a noble act of publication against the grain. I've been called upon to review them two or three times. Not more than 350 words, and please make it lively. <laughs> and I've done my best to square my admiration for John's dedicated life and radiant spirit with doubts as to whether these writings adequately carry his genius, and my rejection of his points of departure and arrival. They are the same. Uh, with wonder at his gigantic circumambulation. Hence uh, the well-hedged tribute of mine, as he has been quoted on the jacket of his latest volume. Even dissenters like myself can be grateful to John Moriarty, for he has gone farther up the front steps to heaven and down the back stairs to hell than most of us will ever dare. Then John left Connemara for distant Kerry to our great loss. 
A year or so later, I went to visit him there. He lives rather isolatedly within a panorama of mountains, which includes a glimpse of just one of the Paps of Dan, Rachich Nana, a special object of veneration for him. Danu, or Anu, the mother of the gods of Ireland, is to be traced back through Indo -European, the Indo-European realm, appearing as Don, the Welsh mother of wizards, reflected in the rivers Don, the river Danube, and others, originating perhaps as a stream goddess, Danu, of Sanskrit texts. On my journey down to Kilani, keeping a lookout to the left from the train window on John's instructions, I had already seen the pair of smooth and shapely hills, each with a prehistoric summit climb <coughs> as nipple, lovely as only breasts can be. The next day, John took me for a walk to their vicinity to rejoice in the, in the return of his strength after long depilitation, and, as it transpired, to invoke the blessing of the goddess on my topographical labours. It was the height of summer. Being taken for a walk by John Mori, Moriarty is like being taken for a walk by a mountain, and we strode out mightily, blown along by a gale of talk. Towards the end of a long, straight lane through farmland, we diverted from the direct approach to the paps and took a loop around a little valley, a dull deshel, clockwise, sunwise, everything having to be done with ceremony, in order to visit a holy place, a holy place known as the City Well, in an ancient kaha or ring fort called Kaha Khrov Dara. Now this kaha is a grassy space enclosed by a low circular rampart of lichen covered stonework, within which one visits, pilgrim-wise, a number of crosses inscribed on rock outcrops and set slabs, and some of them with a little depression like a navel at the centre to which rain and dew supply holy water. Opposite the entrance, and therefore in the place of honour, is the standard blue and white statuette of the Virgin Mary, whose cult has been superimposed on that of the Celtic Mother Goddess. As John made his rounds, running his thumb along the grooves of the crosses, already widened by centuries of believers' thumbs, I hung about the entrance gate like a child dragged unwillingly to church, disapproving of John's reabsorption into the ranks of the pious and sardonically noting the plastic rubbish lying around the holy well. The day already seemed to have taken a wrong turning and was to worsen. When he came out, John told me that a little farm building nearby, which had sheltered a court of poetry in the old days of poetic Kerry, had been bulldozed recently. We walked up through the last of the fields to the commonage. There were no larks. The farmer's annual springtime burning off of dead vegetation had seemed to that. Mounds of stone and rubble had been dumped along the edge of the mountainside, and at the end of the track was the rusty corpse of a car. We took to the slope and found ourselves treading across bare earth, cracked, greyish, with the texture of scar tissue. The hillside looked as if it had been burned, 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 year in, year out. It was the Tir Gast, the wasteland of Arthurian and Celtic legend, the land laid waste and accursed through the king's incapacity, which John interprets as our repression of nature within and without us. We trekked across it in deepening depression. At the brow of the slope we left the burnt out area and trod into good deep heather in the little stream valley coming down from between the paths. Here, John reverently took off his shoes. I did not. <laughs> One more trial was to confront us. A fox stretched out across a tussock of heather as if basking in the sun, embalmed in the hyper-reality of death, converted into an exact simulacrum of a fox, lifelike in every detail, down to the shotgun pellets within it. After that horror, the journey improved. We climbed to the shallow, ripply lake the stream spills out from, and picked our way around it to the beginning of the pass between the two hills. A grey and wind-raked mountain ash, where the way begins to steepen, marks the point beyond which John feels it would be presumptuous to go. Here, speaking out of this deep heart of the island of Ireland, he was to thank me for accomplishing the work it had been given me to do. 
and I could balk and resile no longer. Clambering up to the tree, he reached out and grasped it by one of its many elbows, then stretched back his free hand for me to hang on to. The last chink in the lane, the last link in the chain that would conduct the attenuated and therefore bearable shock of the divine. I have to omit words here once again. They were, like all John's speech, generous, deeply considered, magniloquent, and I rejoice that at the last moment I was granted the good grace to receive them. But they are gone, and the cliffs above have ceased to repeat them. We heard the peregrine falcons exultant shouting to its young far up on those cliffs as we turned away and began to follow the golden brown stream in its tumbling descent. It was still only the middle of the afternoon when we reached the road and the houses. A few people were leaning on their cars outside the school, waiting for the children to come out. A man recognised John's face from a recent TV programme, and we stopped to talk. John told them how we'd been. But we didn't go beyond the Rowan tree, he said. And do you know why? In the booming rhetorical mode he sometimes adopts to cover a shyness. Because it's holy ground. The man inspected him for a moment, and then, in a voice that gave no clue as to the presence or absence of irony, replied, there's a lot of holes in it, right enough. <laughs> Which brought us down to earth again, the worn and torn old earth, through which shows, according to John, the divine ground, and according to me, nothing. Thank you very much. It is only in commonage consciousness that the earth can be saved. We have to take down the fences between us and animals. We have to take down the fences between us and stars. We have to acknowledge the oneness of consciousness that is in the universe. If we don't, we're going to be still in that world of us and them, and they are inferior and we are superior. If we could only once break back into commonage consciousness, then we had a chance. We would be incredibly enriched. We would be so stupendously enriched, and so would the animals be enriched. Well, I, I was deeply impressed by his, I'd have to call it spirituality, although I'm no believer in any, uh, any, uh, um, I'm no believer in spirituality myself. Um, but uh, I admired his absolute wholehearted commitment to what he believed in and, and so on. In, in some ways there were, there were great uh, difficulties between us because um, I'm a, a materialist and an atheist and, um, and so when John talked about uh, divine ground I would have to deny that there is any such thing as a ground. We were opposites, and in a way that was very, very stimulating, and um, for for both of us. And uh, I'd often consult John. <clears throat> it was very good. Sometimes I come across the name of some uh, mystic writer or or uh, saint or something of whom I knew nothing, and I could sometimes phone John, and he would have the answer. Um, and that was a, a great stimulation in in, uh, in Rhinestone and a great surprise to find a, a sage of this sort living in the wood just a few hundred yards away. So certainly he's one of the most important relationships in my life and although as indicated I disagreed with him uh, and the deeper we went the, the more deep our disagreement became. And John uh, had um, he had a, a very good powers of recall of a lot of uh, the English canon of of poetry in particular, which he'd obviously studied at in, at university and uh, memorised a lot of. Uh, he could even quote some of my works. I was amazed to find my own stuff being quoted back at me. Uh, and when he'd written something, he usually sent us uh, uh, a manuscript copy of it, uh, a typescript copy of it, uh, 
to get our opinion, not that our opinion ever uh, had any uh, uh, effect on what he finally wrote at all. But nevertheless, that was part of his work to try and uh, bounce paragraphs and, uh, off me. And I would always be urging him to, um, to begin with a presi. He was sometimes weak on the form of his work. Um, the content was marvellous, but the form was sometimes repetitive. And he would say, well, you know, things are different when they come up in different contexts. And unfortunately, that doesn't always work in writing. Uh, sometimes the thing can just be marooned in another context. And since he always uh, plunged into the middle of his, of his uh, mythic uh, his recall of uh, Irish myths or whatever it was, uh, or his uh, construction of his own mythology, um, I'd often say to him, why don't you start this off with a, a generalizing inter 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 introduction? Or why don't you finish it off with a, a summary of the whole thing, a very abbreviated summary and summation? And he would say, That's, I'll do that. But his method of summing something up was to say it all again. And this is why the books got longer and longer and fatter and fatter. So he would go away and he would write an introduction, but the introduction was as long as the thing itself, and in fact largely repeated it. And so then we suggested that you know, he could write another book from another angle. And... Uh, Again, there would be enormous overlaps between that and the other books. I was impressed by his imagination and I was also impressed by the total integrity of his relationship to his own beliefs and to the external world. He was, uh, for someone whose uh, prime focus was on the spiritual, he was also a very keen observer of, of nature. He knew quite a lot about, about botany, plants and so on. Uh, Part of this picked up during his gardening work, and I don't know really where, where it all came from, but he was quite knowledgeable about such things. Very good at uh, describing nature as well, uh, describing the pine martins scrabbling around on the roof of the little flat that he lived in, in this dark and slightly depressing forest that he was living in at uh, Letter Dive. And I remember his uh, account of walking in Randstone Bog when a, a hare jumped up out of its out of its form. I know a hare makes a sort of hollow for itself in vegetation, which is exactly the shape of the hare where it lies hidden. That's the hare's form. And the hare went bounding off and John walked over to where the form, where it had leapt up from and found the form there. And it was as if he was improv improvising a ceremony. He put his head into the form, it just fitted. That would be his way of uh, sort of re-establishing a unity between himself and the, and the surrounding terrain and the hare, which he had frightened off. There were uh, strange uh, episodes like that, uh, which uh, were deeply formative in his life, and which... Uh, for him, uh, dispel, um, distilled the uh, essence of uh, the sort of relationship of oneness that he was trying to achieve with nature, while at the same time denying that late nature was everything and that ultimately uh, the only thing that mattered was uh, divine ground and what grew on divine ground. Some of the best parts of his book are, of his books are autobiographical and particularly some accounts of his time in Canada teaching there. I remember him telling us uh, a moment of truth for him that he experienced in teaching in the university there. And uh, he was teaching a, a literature class and he looked up from what he was reading English poetry that he was reading 
and a horizontal snowstorm was blowing past the big window outside. And he realised that here he was talking about Keats and nightingales and, and English uh, summer eaves and so on. When this overwhelming force of nature was within a few feet of him. And that was one of the little experiences or realisations that changed his attitude. And uh, I think it was shortly after that that he left academia, gave up his teaching job and came back to Ireland. And eventually, by degrees, became uh, a solitary hermit in a way, very solitary in, in much of his life, although he's also a very uh, gregarious person. But he used to say that uh, he, this was a very, very testing mood of life for him. And eventually he had something approaching a, a mental breakdown, largely out on the bogs of Connemara, um, after episodes like the hare form, or another incident he often described in which he just sat in the branches of a tree listening to the water lapping in a lake and the sound of the lapping sound seemed to him to be utterly deprived of sense. It was deathly because it meant nothing. It was purely mechanical. To me, that would be part of its fascination and part of its uh, alien nature. Uh, uh, on one part alien, but on the other part deeply congruent with my own, our own selves. This uh, thoroughly material note of water being disturbed by wind. Eventually he went off and consulted uh, his ecclesiastical friends and supporters and admirers and uh, counsellors and got some deep help from them uh, in a mode which would be totally foreign to my way of thinking and so I couldn't possibly uh, go along with it. But he certainly lived on an edge and I admired that. Uh, for the he always felt that uh, deep, deep down we agreed and I felt that that was just another symptom of our disagreement, to think that we agreed. Yeah. I'll leave it at that. You know, and it's like a big um, uh, uh, whip of fire, you know, and it kind of cuts things in half and all that. And I was visualising both John Moriarty and Tim Robinson with two of these whips, epistemological this, epistemological that, and they're cutting through language that time, you know. It was a, it was a joy really to see the two of them at it, you know, and, and just to be there at the time, you know, it really was.